for joining us for the Fall 2021 Faculty and Staff Forum. So we're really happy to have our guest speaker here today. Uh, this is Dr. Demir Kovalcevic, an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science. So thank you, Demir. Thank you. Forum is yours. All right. Well, thank you for having me. So um, this is a, uh, my co-author and I, who he's at Loyola University, Chicago. So he's obviously not here today, but I think he's watching on Zoom. So. Hopefully he's not too disappointed with this. Uh, this is our third installment in a trilogy of papers that we worked on. So we worked on a, on a first installment on a, on a chemical weapons paper that looked at just chemical weapons broadly in interstate war. We then focused in on what we called permissible agents or certain marginally related chemicals like Agent Orange and, and Napalm to see why certain agents sort of fall out of the scope of a chemical weapons classification. And then in the third installment, which is what I'm presenting to you today, we wanted to look at what we consider to be the most ambiguous, most puzzling type of um, weapon, which is an, uh, an RCA, a riot control agent, and often something that we refer to as, as tear gas, uh, both as a domestic issue, uh, especially relevant since maybe 2020, especially since 2020, but even before, and as an, interna an ongoing international issue, which we've seen come up again and again in certain international treaties, laws, and, and, and so on. Uh, so we, we started seeing images like this uh, pop up. Uh, we've seen images like this throughout history, much of the 20th century and, and early 21st century, but we saw uh, more and more uh, emphasis, more and more news uh, picking up images like this, uh, crowds of, of, of protesters being tear gassed, and often, often in these cases, uh, peaceful protesters being tear gassed. It just it set a very sort of nasty kind of disturbing uh, picture. It led to a lot of people questioning, what is tear gas? How do I deal with tear gas? How is this possibly legal? How is this possible? You know, how could this be morally right? How could this be socially acceptable? Uh, people started asking questions related to those that know a little bit more about the topic started asking, well, if this is something that's banned in warfare, how could it possibly be used on, you know, American streets against uh, protesters? And so we started thinking about these questions, and we normally deal with the international context. We're both international relations scholars, but we thought that there might also be a domestic story to tell. So we wanted to look at the, the kind of the comparison there and to see how this RCA story has evolved. And I'll use that term RCA um, just as, as a shorthand. So our, our, our general research question is, what was the catalyst for the changing status of riot control agents, RCAs hereafter, use in wartime, and is the same catalyst causing domestic policy change for RCAs today. So if you know about a little bit of the history, I mean, you know, if you're familiar with things like the Hague Conventions prior to World War I, or the Geneva Protocol after World War I, or of course the Chemical Weapons Convention as of 1993, you see progress in terms of what are chemical weapons, to what degree can they be used, and in most cases now none. And over time, you also see the norms around RCAs shift, um, and our understanding of RCAs shift. So how we understand a RCA today and, 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 the, and on the battlefield is very different from how we understood it during the Vietnam War, how we understood it uh, leading up to the Vietnam War throughout you know, World War II, especially World War I, and in that interwar period. And then we thought of some related questions, which uh, maybe an audience that maybe doesn't want to pursue this academically or it might not have as much of an academic interest in it, would still raise these kind of questions. These are the kind of questions that we saw in the media quite often. If, if RCAs have been banned in warfare, then why are they used by police today? That's a legitimate question, right? Um, what does it mean to say that RCAs are non-lethal and or less lethal weapons? Sometimes you see it classified as that. So if it's a non-lethal weapon, then clearly there's an alternative which is lethal. So if it's non-lethal or even less lethal, then it might be okay to use because the alternative is bullets and bullets kill. And then what does the Chemical Weapons Convention, which is the foremost authority today on RCAs uh, from an international standpoint, say about, say about RCAs both as a weapon of war and a law enforcement tool? Because for the first time in, in 1993, we have a clear distinction between the, the, the two realms, the domestic realm and the international realm, and language that pertains to how we want to handle this issue moving forward. Just to give you context, I mean, this is just a selection of the kind of stories we saw popping up. Uh, much of this is... Uh, like there's a critical point, and if you see June 3rd is a is a very critical moment. This is I think about a week or so after the the murder of George Floyd, I, I believe, or, or when, when the protests uh, uh, sweep across the country. A lot of this is very much um, after the incident at Lafayette Square with the former president, right, going for a, a photo op with the with the Bible, and then you see smoke and and, and gas, and, and people's eyes hurt, and people are running and screaming and. 
you see uh, people saying, well, you know, they might have been tear gas or they might, you know, pepper spray might have been used. And so we saw articles like this popping up, you know, how tear gas became the white supremacist's favorite poison. Here are the 100 cities where protesters were tear gassed. Um, uh, most recently, as of last week, tear gas unregulated by U.S. government, safety studies lacking despite widespread use, the House subcommittee finds that on oversight. Um, and then even in 2014, 100 years of, of tear gas use, right? Even then we were asking, how is it that this is still being deployed on a domestic front uh, when in fact um, we've made such progress with it, uh, you could say internationally? So we think it's, it, it's quite relevant. I, I was talking to my co-author and I said, maybe just for once we're working on something that people might care about, maybe. Um, and not that they don't care about chemical weapons or some of these other things, but this is so relevant, it's so in the news today that we're finally working on something that's like ongoing and hasn't even been completely resolved. So maybe somebody might actually read this uh, research project this time. Just to kind of give you an overview of that New York Times article. So widespread protests throughout the United States, which is a positive thing, uh, social justice protests against racial inequality and police brutality, are also met with wide sweeping use of tear gas, which just sort of... Uh, demonstrates two different kinds of stories for you. And it, 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 it just left a lot of people troubled. It left a lot of people asking, again, how is this okay? Left to a lot of these um, kind of stories that were being written where people asked, is it true that RCAs are actually banned in warfare? Or am I just hearing that? Is that actually true? Because if it is true, how does that explain this? And then what are the distinctions that you're making between the international realm and, and the domestic realm and so on? Uh, just briefly, some definitions. So the definition for how we understand t uh, chemical weapons today, um, we've had different iterations of this, of this definition. I mean, it, they were defined in the, in the Hague Conventions, which was 1899. Uh, they were then updated in 1925 with the Geneva Protocol. The Geneva Protocol serves as the authority on what are chemical weapons and, and, and ways that they are banned until 1993 when we passed the Chemical Weapons Convention. It's a much more comprehensive convention. It, uh, in detail, lays out the different types of agents that you can see. The first four types of agents, choking agents, blister agents, blood agents, and nerve agents, are undoubtedly chemical weapons, right? no question about it. Uh, banning in, in terms of use, production, transfer, stockpiling, whatever, whatever you have it, right? Totally off limits. But there's this interesting category right here, which is a riot control agent which is discussed in the Chemical Weapons Convention a little bit more clearly than it ever was before. And just like the other weapons, if used during warfare, it is simply a chemical weapon. You cannot use it on the battlefield. So that's quite simple. And the most common ones we see are tear gas or CS gas or pepper spray, OC. However, states can legitimately possess riot control agents and use them for domestic law enforcement purposes. So that's kind of the puzzling uh, situation here. So if used as a, as, a, as a method of warfare, right, you're breaking international treaty, international law, and, and, and so forth, and you're using chemical weapons. But if used legally, um, uh, appropriately, right, to, let's say, suppress violent mobs or violent riots or, or things of that nature, and again, a lot of this is a judgment call, uh, then it is okay, and it is something that we've seen used throughout the United States and other uh, countries much of the 20th century. So why? Uh, RCAs are also defined under the Chemical Weapons Convention. Notice here the emphasis on temporary. Temporary is, is kind of the key here in, in sort of decoupling this class of weapons from more lethal weapons, right? They, they produce sensory irritation or disabling physical effects, but these effects will disappear, right? They're short-lived. Uh, the CDC, same thing, right? CDC here t basically groups RCAs and tear gas, which isn't necessarily the same thing, but generally when we talk about RCAs in the context of what's happening in this country, tear gas is the most common example that we see. And again, refer to them as com uh, chemical compounds that temporarily make people unable to function by causing irritation, right? So another name for them would be harassing agents or, or irritants. And the, the temporary nature is what's supposed to um, such, distinguish, you know, an RCA from a more lethal weapon and why it might be okay to use, you know, on the streets. And then uh, just a kind of a description of tear gas is Anna uh, Feigenbaum, I think today, if, if, there's a, if there's an authority on tear gas, if there's someone that's done really good work on tear gas, it's her. Um, you know, she's, she's written much about it since 2010. The 2017 book that she's written is, is very uh, instrumental in, 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 in pushing the story. Um, she looks at it again more from a 
domestic perspective, we wanted to see, okay, how is the international and the domestic realm kind of come together here? I think this quote is, is terrifying and kind of, when I was doing this research, it, it was one that always stuck with me and I just, I just can't get over it because I think it demonstrates the two opposing views when it comes to this. Well, some people are certainly in the middle, but like if you're a total proponent for, we should still continue using RCAs on the, in, in, the, in domestic instances because you know, it, it's a more humane alternative to uh, bullets or even batons or, or what may be, or if we wanna you know, forbid these from the, from, from the, from the um, you know, battlefield, um, or if you're someone that just finds this abhorrent, that finds this immorally wrong, I mean, this quote is gonna demonstrate that. Because if, if you're a proponent of it, you're going to say, well, yeah, look, it isolates the individual from the greater mob, right? At that moment, they're so distressed, they're in pain that they can't continue on with the violent riot. So in a way, it's, it's, it's done its effect. It hasn't killed the person, right? But it's just suppressed them enough where they no longer can partake in this type of unruly behavior. But again, we've also made a distinction that this type of action shouldn't be allowed on a battlefield where the purpose of war is to kill, right? Uh, but what, if, you know, from what we understand with international rules of war and international laws are that we have essentially legitimized what is an appropriate way to fight wars, what is an appropriate way to kill, essentially, and we've determined that this isn't one of those. And one of the reasons we determine that is because these types of weapons during the fog of war are often indiscriminate and we often cannot tell if a tear gas is being used or maybe a less lethal weapon or something that's more lethal that we did see during World War I, and so it's problematic. Um, but again, it, it, it's, it's a troubling sort of thing because it goes back to the domestic question of people saying, but if it's so bad in war, how the heck is it okay to be used here, right? It just doesn't make sense to most people. A little history of, of, of chemical weapons and RCAs. We see progress throughout the 20th century. I mean, even in, leading into the 20th century, the Hague Convention uh, addresses this issue. Now, it's not very effective because, of course, we have World War I. For those of you who are familiar with World War I and some of the nicknames associated with World War I, the Great War is one of them, but another one is the Chemist War. And first use um, of tear gas was actually used by the French against uh, German soldiers in trenches. But that first use of tear gas, which at the time, and for a lot of people today, was still considered a non-lethal or less lethal option, led to far more lethal weapons being employed by all the major belligerents, leading to things like chlorine, mustard gas, and phosgene. So this is, of course, troubling. So the international community wants to revisit this issue once again with the Geneva Protocol of 1925. This is a more significant movement in terms of international treaties, international law, and we see what we call international norms sort of developing in a more mature manner. We start considering them far more often, and we really start wanting to decouple what is a conventional weapon versus what is an unconventional weapon. But as we're going to see with RCAs, it remains ambiguous, right? Especially with the United States, who wants to reserve the right to use RCAs domestically and isn't quite sure that using them in war is illegitimate or even unlawful, right? Our position up until even the Vietnam War was, what's wrong with using Agent Orange or herbicides? What's wrong with using napalm, chemical incendiaries? What's wrong with using riot control agents? Nowhere in the Geneva Protocol does it say we can't do that. And so what we're doing is completely lawful. It's completely humane and doesn't violate any, any existing international norms. As we will see, this is also where the pressure campaign mounts, and this is a kind of a turning point for how we consider this, at least gradually. The Biological Weapons Convention is signed uh, soon thereafter, which is a, is a big step, because that, that leads to the decoupling of chemical weapons and biological weapons. And of course, today, the Chemical Weapons Convention, which prohibits the large-scale use, uh, large use, development, production, stockpiling, and transfer of chemical weapons and their precursors. And the chemical weapons does address RCAs in ways that we haven't seen them address before. So just a little bit of context before I get into the cases that we worked on and everything else. So I, I mentioned that this is a trilogy that we've worked on. And in our first two iterations of, of this research, which produced you know, obviously two other papers, we saw that what, what's, what's happening here can kind of be grouped into two different types of arguments, one we call logic of consequences and one we call logic of appropriateness. And the logic of consequences really stems from this materialist, rationalist school of thought, what we call structural realism in international relations, thinking about the cost versus the benefits of a certain action, policy, in this case, a weapon. Essentially asking, what is the utility of this weapon? Uh, does it make sense to use this weapon? Does this weapon achieve strategic goals? If not, maybe it's time to find a, an alternative to this weapon. Doesn't really consider the appropriateness of the action, just what are the consequences for me strategically, 
politically and, and tactically. So uh, some questions that might come up when we're looking at the logic of consequences as a potential explainer in the change of status that we see for RCAs both domestically and internationally. We would ask, does the weapon in question do what it is intended to do? So um, does the, you know, uh, RCAs are designed to cause non-lethal damage, which irritates uh, lacrimatory ducts of the body, thereby dispersing crowds or threats without casualties. If the technology fails to serve its purpose, either by causing more damage, leading up to death, or not fulfilling its intended end of dispersing crowds or threats, the, te the technical effectiveness of the weapon might come into question. The tactical utility asks whether the weapon advances the purpose of the user in a given field of operation. So here we say both domestic enforcement mechanisms and international warfare have a, have a similar goal of obtaining security for the state and its people. However, they do this in different ways. Right? The, the, the goal of law enforcement agencies is to pacify domestic threats through less lethal force where possible. Um, and on the international front, it's to eliminate or pacify international threats through lethal force where necessary. So again, is there a tactical utility to this weapon as compared to maybe other weapons that you could potentially use either on the battlefield or in a law enforcement situation? Strategic effectiveness, does the weapon in question incur domestic or international political ramifications? And here we look at it kind of two ways. Uh, does the weapon itself lead to what we call um, retaliation in kind, right? Does it lead to kind of a deterrent situation where other countries or other actors in this case are thinking about retaliating with similar weapons, which is what we see in, in, in World War I, like if the Germans can use chlorine, then we can respond with chlorine, and if the French are going to use phosgene, then we can respond with that, and then you have a chemical war over the next four years. At the same time, um, strategic effectiveness looks at the political utility of such weapons and whether this has political damage on actors and their overall situations, potentially something like you know, being voted out of office or having to address um, large-scale protests, large-scale demonstrations, a large-scale public pressure campaign to reconsider policies that have maybe been stagnant for so long and that we've maybe taken for granted. On the other hand, you have the logic of appropriateness, which forces us to look at norms. Right? Norms force the actor to consider not just if the weapon is going to get the job done, not just its utility, but whether the weapon is legally, morally, or socially acceptable in the first place. Um, norms go through what we call a norms life cycle. So they emerge, right? And, and then when they emerge in this really nascent stage, this, this building stage, they, we hope that they can regulate certain behaviors and policies and with the, they can restrict other behaviors, right? We hope that these norms uh, gain traction and are adopted by many state actors. If that happens, it leads to what we call a norm cascade, right? a building effect that waves of decision laws and norms have upon one another. This is the maturing stage of a norm where it's becoming quite obvious that this is just immoral, wrong, inhumane. Right? There's a rightness and a wrongness to certain actions that we just develop over time, maybe through customary law, maybe through treaties and so forth, and ultimately ending in what we call maybe international law. And lastly, in the, in the last stage, we have norm internalization whereby the greater international community unquestionably follows moral and legal rules and doesn't question them ever again, right? At, at this point, the norm has been so internalized that it's, 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 it's a no-brainer. And so we're asking, could one of these logics potentially explain a change of status? Because we have seen a change of status, especially internationally, and we're seeing kind of a change of status domestically. So is it a utility question or is it a question about norms? In our first iteration of, of this research project, this three-paper uh, three research project, we really just stuck to these two arguments, but we th and, and we got some comments back, and it, you know it was published. But we were told there might be more to the story than just norms versus you know the, the realist argument of utility and, and, and rationality. And so we started developing other arguments and, and, and wanting to add on to this. And we discovered that there's other things going on that might help reinforce some of these positions. And so we introduced something called systemic shocks. And so in this case, we see that for long periods of time, states will remain fixed in particular equilibrium as issues resolve from policies emerge and then ultimately recede. And so in these periods of equilibria, equilibria, adjustments to policies are slow and gradual. If anything, they're just about tweaking. However, at times, you may see a certain crisis or certain systemic shock that ultimately alters the policy image of, of what we're considering, in this case, RCAs, something that's so significant on the international or domestic stage where we're now again questioning existing norms, hope maybe wanting to alter existing norms, and reconsidering certain policies that have been, that have been in place um, for long periods of time. In our case, we hypothesize that there are two critical events that we see that change the way we think about RCAs in a way that leads to change ultimately. 
On the international front, you have the Vietnam War and its effects, and we'll talk about that in a sec. And on the domestic front, we see that the, the main catalyst really doesn't occur until 2020. And, and maybe the events leading up to 2020 a little bit, but that peak moment following the murder of George Floyd, following the widespread protests around the United States, you have a systemic shock that rocks the United States in a way where the issue once again becomes relevant. Right? It's covered by nightly news. It's on social media. Right? There's instructions and tutorials on what is tear gas, how to deal with it. Right? It becomes a mainstream issue in ways that it never has in the 100 years that it existed, or in this case, 107 years. And so we think that these systemic shocks help maybe reinforce existing norms or existing utility uh, calculations. And on top of that, we look at the issue saliency and the social and political pressure that uh, relevant groups might put uh, on, on actors to, 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 to change policy. If the systemic shock that disrupts the equilibrium also happens to be a salient issue, the likelihood of policy change may increase. In this case, we think that RCAs were a very salient issue leading up to the Vietnam War, and especially you know, during the Vietnam War and, and right after. I think for much of the international community and domestic community, there's a lot of pressure on the administrations of Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, even as they were defending their use, even as they were wholeheartedly saying that this is not wrong, it's not breaking any laws. They had to constantly defend their actions in ways that they hadn't before. Um, and if, this is, if the saliency sustained over time, um, uh, then the issue uh, appears more likely to be developed, dealt with with representative institutions. And then we also to take into account what we call these advocacy networks, what we call epistemic communities or, or what we call knowledge communities. Citizens groups, legal challenges, and media coverage may put additional pressure on policymakers to reconsider and alter RCA policies. So this was a point that we developed in our second paper where we called it a kind of a social feedback loop, that the social feedback loop reinforces some of these existing norms helps people kind of think about norms that they may have forgotten about or may have taken for granted, or even more, helps people think about how norms can develop moving into the future as new technologies are introduced and new ways of thinking and uh, norms themselves have to be reevaluated. All right, so we're qualitative scholars, so this is, this is our, these are our results, this is how it looks. Um, just kind of uh, walk you through what we found. Again, um, Kind of a work in progress. I'm, I'm skeptical to, to kind of give you a verdict, but I will try. Basically, when we look at RCA's, the first case study in war, um, we see this story that seems pretty, I guess what's the word? Uh, you could say pretty static throughout the 20th century until, of course, the events of, of the Vietnam War. Now, World War I is where we see the emergence, or the, the events after World War I is where we see the norm emergence for the first time. Like, for the first time, the, the international community is, is, in a kind of concerted effort, uh, taking the steps to ban these kinds of weapons from the battlefield. Much of it has to do with the learning and experience of what we saw during World War I, both the use of tear gas and the use of CWs thereafter. Um, World War I is the last time where we see this on the battlefield at this kind of, uh, at, at this level. Now there are deviations throughout the 20th century. In the interwar period, Italy uses chemical weapons in, in Ethiopia. Uh, Japan uses them against Chinese civilians. The Germans use them in concentration camps. We see the use of Egypt. Egypt uses chemical weapons in Yemen. Of course, Iraq and Iran in the 80s. And then the interesting case of the United States and the Vietnam War. But largely, right, we see a trend towards non-use, which is positive. And much of that has to do with this uh, post-World War I period, what I call this kind of peacetime wartime paradox. What was interesting in that period, and what would cer certainly kind of um, establish where we would go until about 1993, is that law enforcement agencies across the 1920s adopt tear gas as a crowd control tool. So it's being commercially and domestically sold to law enforcement agencies, Right? And by 1923, it's 600 different law enforcement agencies across the country utilizing chemical weapons, buying them from the chemical weapon service or other private uh, producers. And it becomes a tool that, again, is, is, is uh, advocated as it's, it's less lethal, it's more humane, it's just a better alternative to control crowds. The language that they often used was mobs or riots. I'll go more into that with the other case. But at the same time, right, right during that same time, we were developing a norm to ban chemical weapons on the battlefield. So you got these two stories that go in completely different directions. You got a commercial use of tear gas and as, as a humane way to, to deal with crowds. And then you have the Geneva Protocol, which wants to ban the use of chemical weapons. And as a lot of states at that time understood, this also meant RCAs. 
not the United States. We get to the Vietnam War where it stays fairly stagnant until there's a pressure campaign put on the Nixon administration to review our CBW policy. That ultimately happens where we decouple BWs and CWs as, as, as totally different classes of weapons. And by 1975, the United States finally ratifies the Geneva Protocol. Maybe I should have said that earlier, right? The United States doesn't actually ratify the Geneva Cr Protocol in 1925, which gives us a little bit more wiggle room, I guess you could say, in how we, uh, the policies that we enact in, in Vietnam. But throughout this period, as this pressure campaign is building, as people are protesting the war, as people are seeing images of gas being used in Vietnam, the questions start piling up that, or, or people start asking, is the United States guilty of using poisonous gas in Vietnam? Is the United States using chemical weapons in Vietnam? Right? It's, it's a serious effort by members of Congress, the general public, and especially the scientific community who are saying, this is not just inappropriate. Like This looks really, really bad, but this might have really bad long-term effects that you're not even considering. And time and time again, even though we didn't ratify the Geneva Protocol, we defended our position, especially in the cases of RCAs, which we saw as a different ca class of categories and CWs, as being both appropriate and legal because the Geneva Protocol, in our th in opinion, never totally um, banned these, the use of these weapons. And of course, we defended it by pointing to the streets of, of, of you know, in the United States and saying, look, these are being used legitimately and lawfully and responsibly, again, that's a judgment call, by law enforcement agencies. And of course, a lot of people pushed back and said, you cannot, in this case, compare domestic law to international law, right? There's differences to this kind of stuff. But that was our defense of something that we knew was becoming very unpopular very quickly, right? The, the tides were turning, and this ultimately leads to things like, hey, we signed the convention. That's a huge step moving forward. We adopt the uh, Biological Weapons Convention. In uh, 1775, two days after signing the convention, President Ford uh, puts in Executive Order 11850 in that says, we renounced the first use of RCAs and herbicides, but with several caveats. So for the first time, we've actually said, okay, we will not use these on the battlefield. However, we do reserve the right to use them for limited defensive measures, right, with presidential authority. Again, not a total re uh, um, uh, renouncement against these weapons, but a positive step in the right direction. And this kind of builds into what is ultimately what I call the norm internalization phase with the signing of the Chemical Weapons Convention. It passes the U.S. Senate with a 74 to 26 vote in favor of CWs, again with several caveats. But for the first time now, we, ha we, have, an R we have RCAs as understood as chemical weapons is used as, as, you if used as methods of warfare. Um, and this is significant. Now, the United States Senate was very gung-ho on saying, we will sign it, right? And they're telling Clinton this at the time. We will sign it. However, you cannot, um, we have to retain Executive Order 11850. So if, if we can retain that order, which gives us under strict circumstances, right, under totally defensive measures, right, where we're prisoners of war, where civilians are in harm, or where, you know, we're, uh, where we need to sort of clear out certain uh, areas, under, under these kinds of circumstances, we shouldn't totally ban the use of, of RCAs. But on the battlefield, yes, we do agree that they will be considered a method of warfare, and, 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 and we'll sign it on that front. And at that time, 165 countries did, and today 193 have. So 98% of the world community agrees. But it left um, the question of RCAs as a domestic tool uh, still sort of up in the air. If we actually go to the probably the more interesting case, on the domestic front, that post-World War I period essentially sets up how we come to view RCAs on the domestic front, basically up until maybe 2020, where we really start questioning again in a very serious effort. I mean, Amos Fries was the, the head of the Chemical Warfare Service. So you have to understand this. When, when World War I ends, he wants to retain a job that he no longer thinks is, is, is needed because we're not going to go back to the battlefield and use chemical weapons. So out of self-interest, he thinks, how do I retain my job, and what do I do with the stockpile of all these chemical weapons that I have? Like, i got to do something with them, and I want to keep my job. So he starts commercially uh, appealing and, 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 and going around and lobbying for these weapons. He lobbies Congress. He lobbies the incoming Harden, uh, Harding administration. And um, he demonstrates their unharmful nature on a, on, a, on a Girl Scout troop, including his daughter. So he actually tear-gassed his own daughter and a Girl Scout troop to demonstrate just how harmless these types of weapons are. And it worked. 
because, right, as the international community was going and moving in a direction where we wanted to ban chemical weapons and restrict chemical weapons and really consider um, even the, whether it's the utility or the inhumane nature of these weapons, these were being sold um, largely to law enforcement agencies across the country. The Bonus Army, which uh, consisted of World War I vets who, who protested in Washington, D.C., who wanted their bonus payments for the war uh, earlier due to the Great Depression. They were supposed to get them in 1945. They wanted them in 1932. Ultimately, to deal with this crowd, they were, they were tear gassed. Right? A, a low point in President Hoover's, many low points of his, of his presidency, right? This was one of those. Um, protesters are uh, tear gassed in Berkeley in 1969, once again. And in 1969, when we're considering uh, um, uh, ratifying the Geneva Protocol, Congress at the time is very clear that the RCA ban provision um, remains in fact, remains um, in place when it comes to domestic law enforcement. We get to the 1990, uh, 1990s era. The Clinton administration finds that law enforcement use of RCAs is still consistent with international and domestic laws. Right? So that becomes the caveat. And in 1997, when we finally pass the CWC, right, the law enforcement exemption remains. In 1998 and 2005, that's reaffirmed. And in 2016, that's also reinformed by the Department of Defense. So in all of these instances, right, especially since 1920 and onward, the, 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 the answer is basically the same. Yes, these are methods of warfare today, and they should not be used on the battlefield. But for law enforcement purposes, they are legitimate, and they are in line with existing international law and treaties. But we see a change in 2019, and specifically at the peak of 2020, where you see the domestic use of RCA being questioned, right? It's legality, it's morality, it's, it's, it's social acceptance. We see a level of restraint appear in certain cities or states. We see certain federal laws being taken up. Now, these, none of these have been passed, or excuse me, these are bills. None of these bills have been passed, but they have been considered in a way that we haven't seen before. Uh, language referring to the pre preventing the misuse of tear gas act or no tear gas or projectiles act, right? Congressional oversight of unjust policing act. Certain cities have moved and certain states have moved to actually ban tear gas use, such as Oregon or Colorado, uh, Minneapolis, Portland, Seattle, Salem. But there's always these weird exceptions. Like in the case of Colorado and Oregon, it's like, you, you know, you, police cannot use tear gas, but for, riot, for riots, there's an exception. And a riot is five or more people acting violently. And if you give them a, f a fair warning and they still don't seize and they're still acting violently, then maybe there you can use tear gas. But in all other instances, you're not allowed to use it. Right? But we start, we start seeing the conversation develop in ways that we haven't before. Right? Since 1914, when the French uh, use this openly in the battlefield, it just becomes a norm across law enforcement agencies and something that, yes, people question, but doesn't really get the needle moving in any positive way. And for once, and, for, and finally, I think we're kind of seeing that today. And so uh, the question is, well, you know, why now? Right? Well, what, what is it about this moment that acts as a systemic shock uh, in this situation? Well, we think there's, there, there are moral concerns with RCAs as a weapon of war against this domestic civilian population. We're seeing that uh, come up again and again. We are seeing legal concerns being drawn against the legitimacy of RCAs. If there's supposed to be less lethal enforcement option, um, what accounts for some of the injuries and harms that are caused by their use? Physical injuries, psychological injuries. Um, a lot of the long-term uh, effects are unknown, but it doesn't mean that there aren't long-term effects. Response to protests during 2020 following George Floyd murder in Minneapolis and the events at Lafayette Square in Washington, DC. Uh, and increased exposure to the populace to the effects of tear gas, uh, those who were directly impacted by it and those indirectly who see it through the media and, and, and uh, social media. You know, the event with Lafayette Square was interesting because if you remember that event and that had happening and you see gas and you're like, what is happening? How is this even okay? The administration at the time said, we were not using tear gas, we we're using pepper balls, right? And so they, they, right away they wanted to defend it as something that wasn't tear gas. And most people that are asked would say that the effects are relatively the same, right? They have similar effects, they have a similar uh, purpose behind it. Um, but the fact that you have to go on television and defend the fact that, well, no, it wasn't tear gas, it was this other thing that might be okay. And then if you really think about it, tear gas is something that law enforcement officials are allowed to use anyway. So if you, you know, and if it's a violent mob, then, you know, there you go. That obviously wasn't the case of that, but again, it, it's a judgment call. So I guess if we had to, if I had to kind of sum it up, what we're looking at, I would say that on the international front, we have seen norms working uh, 
to slowly but surely ban or outlaw or reconsider what we mean by RCAs. I mean, the fact that we consider them a method of warfare today is a huge development. And the systemic shock of Vietnam and the events that followed after Vietnam were crucial for that. I mean, you probably don't have that movement, especially on an act like the United States, which is hesitant, without an event like Vietnam. However, the fact that we still reserve their use for certain, domestic, for certain defensive measures, and, and this was brought up in 2003 when Bush entertained the idea and, and Donald Rumsfeld entertained the idea, um, sort of sours the, the, the norm, right? I, I don't want to whole, wholly kind of endorse it because um, you would have to sort of go all the way with it, right? Maybe, no, make no exception for it, right? Just, just say it's, it's, it's banned internationally, it's banned as a method of war, it's banned in all sorts of instances. On the domestic front, we see a more stagnant uh, picture, but one that we see developing maybe positive ways as of 2020 in an unfolding story. We see a, 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 an equilibrium that basically establishes after 1920, we see a very successful campaign to uh, market these weapons as legitimate law enforcement tools, and that remains the, the, the emphasis until really 2019-2020, where we again start reconsidering uh, not just the utility of these weapons, but the, but, the, but the humanity of these weapons. And so we still think, even as these weapons are defended domestically from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and onward, the language that's often used with these weapons is, hey, there's still a less lethal or non-lethal or more humane way and a better alternative to bullets. I mean, this is kind of what we're really thinking about. Like, Oppo opponents to or proponents of the use will say, well, if we didn't have gas, what would be alternative? Alternative is physical force, right? It's a way that you hamstring police officers. That's basically what the, what the opinion is. And for others is, look, if it's a product of war, if it's a chemical warfare agent, I mean, there's no more serious charge than that than calling something maybe a nuclear weapon. There really isn't a more serious charge in the international system. Then how can you possibly still use it on the domestic front? And so this is a story that I think we're still working on, we're still developing, we're, we're seeing these kind of two diverging international and domestic stories, in some ways similar and in other ways different. We think there's something to say about norms, we like norms, we think that appropriate behavior matters, we're, we're strong proponents of, of, of that position. Uh, but we also recognize these systemic shocks and the kind of impact they have on, on, on how we think about these things, and how we reinforce uh, our thought process. So I'll end there, I'm, I'm thirsty, so I'll need some water, yeah, that's enough. Yeah. Hopefully that was, I think that's, yeah. Right. And we have a question or two. Yeah, Jason. So, you mentioned how in 94, President Clinton said it was consistent with other international tactics and uses. Um, I guess, I'm just curious, what were the, who was he comparing it to? What were, what were in particular other countries that this was consistent with? Well, you used, well, even today and then, it, you know, it's used in Venezuela. It's used in. It was used in, in Palestine during the the, the first Intifada. It was used in in China. It was used in Hong Kong. It, it was used in, in Britain. It was used in France. Um, so we were sort of comparing ourselves to similar actors who were who were, who were of the kind who were saying, look, this is something that's used in many instances where you have an unruly mob, you have an unruly crowd, you have a violent crowd. Again, all of that is a judgment call because in most of these cases, they're not violent crowds. They're just a lot of protesters and you don't like the protesters, right? And so you tear gas them. And the question then is, well, if, if, if five people are being unruly in a crowd of thousands and thousands of people, do you still have the right to, to engage with this? And so that was really our defense. And, and we just kept reiterating this, this position that, no, on the battlefield, it doesn't make sense to use them because they'll probably lead to more lethal agents and we don't want to kill people that way in, in war. But on the domestic front, we really don't have any other alternative. And so if you don't give us any other alternative, this is the most humane way we can deal with potentially violent crowds. I mean, a violent crowd was January 6th. I mean, that is a truly violent crowd. So I guess if you don't have tear gas, I mean, how would you deal with that crowd? I don't even know if tear gas was used against that crowd, maybe in some instances. That is an easy case, but most of these cases are not easy, right? They're not one or the other. And so that was really our defense of it, but it often just became problematic and it was questioned over and over. But he needed it to appease a Republican Senate at that time that was unwilling to move. John McCain being the biggest proponent of it, saying that unless this measure is in there, I'm not going to sign it. And so.